Okay, this is where we will begin the notes for the history of theater. So this first section is all about the dawn of theater and the beginning of theater up until about the 1800s. This is a wildly long stretch of time, so please don't see this as anything but the fastest of possible super fast overviews of information. And uh, I just want to kind of give you an idea of the past so that you can kind of see where things came from. A lot of terms come from the past and, you know, Interestingly, even though technology has increased, the history of theater includes some of the best plays ever written still to this day, kind of bringing to mind how little mankind has changed from, you know, literally thousands upon thousands of years ago until now, dealing with a lot of the same issues, problems um, that we've always been dealing with in different ways. So you've got a blank notepad there, or not a blank notepad, a uh, thing of notes that I made filled with blanks that I will be reading through. Please break this up into several sittings. This is going to be a pretty long video in which I talk about the dawn of theater through many, many cultures and many time periods. It's five pages of notes. That's a lot. And there's a lot of links in there that I really do want you to click on and check out and maybe look at some of the related videos if you're interested. There's a lot of cool stuff to this. So this is actually going to take us through three days is the idea. So don't you know, overdo it by having all of it in one sitting. Okay, so um, we are going to be talking about a few key trends in dramatic literature. So that means the writings that dramas are done. Think of it like scripts, but not necessarily scripts. Um, and we're starting with basically how does drama begin? And really the main idea is that dramas began as religious rituals, rites where dances, songs, chants, hymns, prayers were used that eventually evolved beyond just a ritual, religious ritual into something that is more scripted, into something that's more of a story. Greek liter literary drama, which is really high level and, and lots of wordplay and things like that, ends up becoming more sensational and entertaining in Rome. Rome, as they are wont to do, just kind of like peeks over Greeks uh, the Greeks' shoulders to uh, kind of copy everything that they did because they really liked it. They were super, super lovers of Greek. Obviously, the Romans had a lot of their own positive contributions to theater, but that's kind of the, the really wide, simplifi simplified version of it. Uh, Chinese dramas, which began as very um, measured and slow, become much more action-oriented after the Mongols invaded in the 1200s. And We'll talk about we'll talk about that obviously. These are all just kind of overview things. And Japanese drama develops the formal no plays and the more popular and melodramatic kabuki plays. You might be familiar with the idea of a kabuki mask, uh, but we'll talk about that as things go forward. After that, we're going to be talking about key trends in technical theater. So that whole unit where we talked about everything that we do to put together a play, lights, sound, etc. Um, all of that had to be invented created, so to speak, and and we're still going through these creations today. Greek and Roman amphitheaters included painted scenery that was simple, basic stage technology such as a crane that would raise and lower gods onto the playing area. So now we have these crazy fly rigs. We talked about Spider-Man Turn Out the Dark, uh, but before it was just a simple, very visible crane uh, with no particular way to hide it. In China and Japan, there was a lot of use of very symbolic props, costumes, and makeup, and we'll talk about that. You know, obviously today we know that there are a lot of things that are symbolic in the way that we deal with props, costumes, and makeup, and we talked a lot about how different colors can signify different things uh, in terms of emotions. So that was a whole big unit there. And um, that has its roots in a lot of very codified uh, types of symbolism in these early types of theater. No and kabuki theaters use specific, distinctive architecture and innovative stagecraft, including ramps, trap doors, and later, revolving stages. So now it's seen as a really, well, maybe not now. When I was a child, it was really innovative if you had a uh, stage that could uh, revolve around, but that actually started long and long ago. And um, Greeks used the skein and Hindu theater, the green room, as a place for actors to change costumes, relax, prepare, get ready for different things. Okay, so these are kind of the basic wide overview things of what we are going to be talking about in these notes today. 
um, let's start with kind of the beginning, as, as early as we can go back. So when we talk about the early peoples, it, it can go across anything, anywhere. Uh, the earliest drama started as dance ceremonies and pantomimes that told of various tribal traditions or rites of passage. And they evolved into religious rituals in which the chief representative of the gods, which could have been a shaman or a priest, donned a mask, believed to have powerful magic, and prayed, chanted, and danced to drive away evil while the tribe assisted or watched. You can already see some of the beginnings of what we would call a theatrical performance there, even though it's not necessarily something that is scripted, although obviously not all performance needs to be scripted. Uh, they all did have their roots in very cultural milestones. So a rite of passage in terms of, you know, a boy becoming a man, a, a girl becoming a woman, uh, a child becoming a warrior, different things like that, um, where you would become, you know, maybe a father, uh, these really important moments in life. And today you can still see some remnants of these rituals in South Africa and Australia, the native peoples there, uh, the Hawaiian hula in different uh cultural dances, as well as uh, Native American dances, or Indigenous Peoples, First Nations, whichever you are more comfortable with there. Moving on past that, we get to the Egyptians in 3000 BCE. They seem to be the earliest group whose rites began to look like our conception of a play. They are very concerned with life after death, especially surrounding their pharaohs, and we know this because we see these giant monuments, the, the pyramids, among many others, things, uh, built to honor them, be their passage into the afterlife. And often these were filled with uh, great wealth and and things like that. Uh, oftentimes their servants were buried with them so that they could have opulence in the afterlife as well as the opulence they had in this life. Pharaohs considered in many ways uh, gods themselves in human form. These sorts of plays were written for important events. Many were written in the walls on hieroglyphics. So a lot of the hieroglyphics that you can see in tombs and things like that uh, tell stories of plays that were often performed uh, ritualistically. So again, we're still at the very beginning here. We're still very close to religious ritual. It's not necessarily something that is different here. Moving forward, we could talk about Hebrew theater. Um, and although there is no definite theater, like a building that somebody would go to or something like that, referred to in ancient texts, including the Bible, there are aspects of the Old Testament that can be considered dramatic literature, the Old Testament largely written in Hebrew. Um, specifically here, we're talking about the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, depending on which biblical translation that you have, which contains a poetic dialogue between a bride and a groom, and it is filled to the brim with racy metaphors. Um, when I was a child learning about this, I remember being told, oh, be careful with Song of Solomon. And so when I was, you know, 11 or 12, I was, oh, oh I'm going to read it. This is the this is the racy book of the Bible. And you look at it and it's like, the metaphors are like, her breasts were like gazelles. I, I, I didn't know what to do with that when I was 12. I didn't know if gazelles were supposed to be really, really attractive, but Anyway, if you if you look at that, you can see that it's written as a, a conversation, and um, often it has been turned into a play where there's a chorus that reads out some parts, and then a bride and a groom that will read out other parts. The book of Job in the Old Testament is the story of a man's suffering and confrontation with God. Um, both of these stories have been adapted to the stage various times, including a version of Job that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1959 by a man named Archibald MacLeish, and it was called J.B., um, <laughs> it's, it ran for th over 350 performances and it, um, it was placed in a modern day circus where Mr. Zuss, the balloon vendor is God and Nichols, the popcorn man is Satan. Please find this for me. I want to watch it. It sounds bizarre. Uh, I would love, please go watch it and tell me if it's any good. Actually, that's, that's what I'm going to say. Um, okay, moving forward, uh, we get to the Greeks. Now, okay, Hebrew and Egyptian were very short. Greeks we're going to spend a lot of time on because in many ways they are the beginning of truly what we would consider the theater. Um, in Greek theater, there was a, a golden age, a classic age, and only the Elizabethans, who are contemporaries of Shakespeare, came close to 
con producing a similar number of plays during this time. Some of the plays written here are still considered by many scholars to be some of the greatest plays ever written. And again, you get that sense of how, how could that be, right? They didn't have access to these moving sets and these screens and all these magical things that we can do now. And yet the true substance of theater is in the feeling that it gets, the story that it portrays, the themes that are being communicated. And humans, despite the fact that we have moved, you know, 5,000 years past this, uh, in, the, in the case of Egyptian theater, and 2,500 years past this from the Golden Age uh, in Greek theater, we still are essentially the same. That's wild. That's crazy. I love it. Uh, okay, so Greek theater, as everything else, began as religious rites meant specifically to pay homage to the god Dionysus, the god of wine and fertility, a favorite god among many Greeks as, you know, might be pretty obvious. Um, from these rituals first came tragedies. And there's a lot of speculation about this, but uh, the the reason why in a celebration you might want to watch tragedies, uh, you know, there's a, a few different ideas. So these plays would be heavy, yes, but at the end of it, you get this feeling of what is called catharsis. We talked about this a while ago, if, if, if you don't remember. Catharsis is that emotional feeling of completeness, of oh, like you, you take a breath and finally, yes life makes sense and, and, and I experienced that. Um, it was about experiencing a strong emotion and then coming out of it stronger for it, relieved of some of your own angst and tension. Um, <laughs> what I love about this is a lot of the words that we get for theater come from the Greeks. So thespian, you might know is a word for theater, comes from a Greek dude named Thespis, who was one of the very first, very successful playwrights. Um, tragedy literally means goat song in Greek. Tragos is the word for tragedy. There's a lot of speculation, not a lot of knowledge about exactly why tragedy would come you know, why would be goat, goat song? Uh, possibly it's because the chorus wore goat skins. Possibly because they draped the altar, uh, which was on the stage, in goat skin. Possibly because a goat was sacrificed as an offering to the gods during this festival. Nobody really knows. It could be all three. It could be none of them. Maybe they just found the sound of a goat just, just very mournful and sad. Who, who knows? Um, Greek theater was not always exactly the way that we imagine it. So really, there was usually only one actor at the beginning, eventually led on by different people uh, to, to be two to three, and then more actors uh, that would actually be individuals in the, in the play. Um, and then a chorus. Uh, the chorus, it basically started out as three chorus members and one actor, and then eventually the chorus got smaller and then bigger again, and multiple actors and things like that. Uh, the chorus did most of the work. Uh, the chorus would basically tell you the story, whereas you would have the one actor sort of doing something, sometimes acting it out, sometimes giving speeches, and sometimes interacting uh, with the chorus in that way. But it was really centered around the chorus telling the story. Okay, so back to Greek theater. There were four festivals for Dionysus. Four! Uh, but the one held in March, in this, which was called the City Dionysia, um, became a festival specifically of tragedies, and a prize was awarded to the best series of plays. The festival was a five to six day holiday in which people would watch plays, drink wine, and celebrate. Again, you can see why Dionysus was probably one of the most popular gods uh, in the Greek pantheon. Uh, the first couple days would revolve around them carrying around pictures of Dionysus, and um, you know, generally partying. And then in the last three days, they would get together and they would watch um, a lot, a lot of plays. Um, so each day would feature a different dramatist who specially chosen. It was an honor to even be chosen. And each day you would watch three tragedies and then you would end it with a satire for some comic relief at the end uh, so that you didn't go home too sad. Uh, so yeah, even though that catharsis does feel nice, if you just watched three sad stories in a row, maybe you want to watch something happy. It's kind of like uh, the first sort of binge watching of uh, entertainment. <laughs> we do that now on Netflix. They just did it, you know, watching real plays. Uh, the winning author and his financial backer, called a Corrigus, got to wear an ivy garland around their heads. So it was part of the prize is you get to proclaim to everybody that you are the best by wearing this ivy garland. 
Uh, of course, they did have comedies as well, but they were more popular in early February at a different festival for Dionysus again. Um, the word for comedy comes from the Greek word komos, which means a group of revelers, a group of partiers. And uh, that, that fits more, I think, than, than goat song fits. Um, in performance, plays were almost always performed outdoors. Initially, it would just be, you know, okay, here's a hill. Uh, we'll build some benches on that hill, and there will be a packed dirt um, performance space with an altar on it. Uh, there's my first link here that you can click on. Later, the whole side of a mountain would be scooped out with tiers of seating like an amphitheater. And that video is wild. It tells you how specific and precise they could be, how much knowledge they had about how sound moved and traveled and their ability uh, at the time. Really watch that video. It's really cool. Do some, watch more videos. Watching about the Greeks, to me anyway, is, is so fascinating about the things that they were able to come up with and the things that they were able to do without the modern technology that we have today. Unbelievable what they were able to, go, able to accomplish. Uh, the Skeen, where we get the word scene, uh, was a small building where actors could change, kind of like a green room, which we talked about above. Uh, costumes were relatively simple. Uh, there were several types of robes that you could wear, uh, and often masks were used to communicate character and emotion at a distance. Uh, several different types. So if you're a certain type of character, you'd wear a certain type of robe and things like that. They'd be very colorful, very brightly um, decorated. And the masks were not just, you know, over your face. Uh, they went around your whole head, actually. And uh, in, the, in some of them, there are really early types of uh, megaphones built in so that sound could travel a little bit better from the actor's mouth. Um, you know, this is a lot closer to the melodramas that we talked about earlier in the year. Uh, you know, there's not going to be a lot of subtlety in their performance because you're just outside and you have to shout to a large group of people. And so uh, that is where Greek theater began. Um, Perioc toys, I have no idea if I'm saying that right, but I did my best, uh, are triangular sets that could be moved around for scene changes. So it's, it's almost like they had an early form of a unit set uh, and different backgrounds were painted with scenery that were very simple. Um, most of it took place in the imagination. Compare that with, you know, when we were watching musicals this year, how expansive and wide ranging a lot of the scenery was. Uh, there were some props used, some drums, some instruments, but mostly it was... Uh, not not heavily done. Uh, the goal was not necessarily to mimic real life as in terms of what you looked at. Uh, it was it was more to communicate ideals, ideas, uh, and human experience. Uh, all death, all death occurred off stage and was recorded reported to the audience by the chorus. So the chorus, like I said, did most of the work. You wouldn't have people having to die on stage. They would walk off, and the chorus would be like. That guy died. He just died. They'd be specific about it, obviously. Uh, Deus Ex Machina, a term that I can't remember if we've talked about yet this year, literally means God out of the machine. It's the name of a special type of crane used to lower and raise gods in their play. Today, we still use that term, uh, but now it's just for kind of any plot device that conveniently solves a problem near the end of a story, the death of a previously unknown rich relative, for example. So, oh man... What, whatever will I do? How could I possibly... Oh, look, my aunt died and gave me $30 million. I can solve all my problems. Um, overly convenient would be the way to describe those sorts of things. Perhaps you can think of some deus ex machinas in stories that you have read. They're not always bad, necessarily. They're fine. Uh, a lot of kids' cartoons will have things like that because it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, kids aren't paying super close attention to things like that. Uh, some great Greek playwrights are the tragedians. Uh, so, so I'm talking about tragedians, writers of tragedy, and uh, comedians. The tragedies survive much longer and tend to be more popular, although uh, you might be surprised about the sort of comedy that are in some of the in some of the comedies, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so the tragedians are Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Uh, Aeschylus is a tragic poet. He won first prize in that festival that I talked about earlier, the city Dionysia, 13 times, and is credited with inventing the concept of the trilogy. The MCU has a lot to give him. Again, things like that are crazy to me, like thinking about somebody inventing 
the trilogy, three stories that, that match up together. It's wild. Uh, he wrote 90 plays, but only seven have survived, of which his Arrestia trilogy is the most enduring. And that, unfortunately, is the story for a lot of these Greeks, is it happened so long ago that even though we have reference to maybe how many uh, plays were written by different authors, um, very few survive to today. And there's a lot of like, man, I wonder what could it have been? What was in there? What What are we missing? Um, and sometimes we do find new ones, as we'll talk about uh, with Menander, one of the comedians later. Sophocles is the next famous guy. Uh, he wrote more than 100 scripts and he won 18 festivals. Some of his uh, uh, plays that he wrote are still taught and performed today, and some of them are vastly, vastly influential. Uh, Electra, Oedipus Rex, and Antigone are all from him. I know that Miss Allen teaches Antigone. Uh, it's the story of social justice, essentially. It's a story of social justice and basically asks the question, what do you do when the law is not lawful? Um, Antigone is the name of a woman whose brother dies and she wants to bury him properly with the proper rights. But the king, Creon, has decided that anybody who follows the old gods, uh, not the old gods, but the other gods, uh, and anybody who speaks out against him, sorry, should not be given a proper burial. And her brother died because of a rebellion that he was a part of. And he restricts her from burying her brother with all those rights. And ultimately, it's a it's a conversation about, you know, are the law and morality always the same thing? Oedipus Rex uh, is the story uh, that you might be familiar with of a young man who uh, is born, of course, as all young men are, who is born to a father and a mother. Uh, and the father hears a prophecy where this son was supposed to kill him and marry his wife. So the son kills his father and marries his mother. The father does not want this to happen. And so uh, much to his wife's sadness, sends the young man away. He grows up and ends up going on a journey. Uh, and he meets up with a sphinx who asks him a riddle. And ultimately, he doesn't know who his parents are. Uh, because he doesn't know this, he ends up getting to a fight with the man who is his father and marrying that man's wife, who is his mother, thus fulfilling the prophecy uh, that was given in the very beginning of the story. Kind of like uh, Master Uguay said, a man often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. Euripides is the next guy. He's a very meditative thinker who would just go off and spend time in a cave near the sea. Uh, he focused on the psychological motivations of, and uh, social consciousness. So he especially dealt with the plight of women and outsiders. He wrote Medea, a story about a woman who goes insane with jealousy, and Alcestis, which uh, has comedic bits in it. So he kind of drew the line between comedy and tragedy there. Uh, on the comedic side, you have a guy named Aristophanes and a guy named Menander. Aristophanes wrote body-biting satires like the birds, the frogs, and the clouds. Uh, the Frogs has been created into a modern comedic musical and has been performed from the 70s up until now. It's very silly and a little bit inappropriate, as most comedies are. Uh, I included a link there where you could check out um, just one of the first songs that are in it. It's, it's funny, and it makes fun of all of the sorts of jokes that Aristophanes makes, you know, old performers or old, um, old plays are thought to have this very dignified and highfalutin sort of idea. But, you know, all of those things that are famous, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Aristophanes, they're filled with fart jokes and poop jokes and all the same sorts of stuff that are in media today. So don't let somebody tell you that we've really gone downhill because we started downhill. That's what people like, fart jokes. Uh, Menander uh, focused on lampooning private life as opposed to Aristophanes who focused on the public square. He wrote of cunning servants, parasitic relatives, protective fathers, and young lovers. Previously, there were only bits and pieces of his work that survived, but in 1957, the entirety of his play, The Curmudgeon, was discovered. And that is the Greek. So they're uh, very, very highly influential. We talked about Aristotle's um, different lenses through which you look at it, remember it, thought, plot, action, diction, sound, and spectacle, uh, the ways that you judge a play. Uh, he was looking at these famous authors back here. Moving on to Roman theater. Um, as I said before, the Romans pretty much copied the Greeks, but didn't do it quite as well as they did. 
um, tragedies and comedies ended up being... So with the Greeks, uh, a lot of the uh, upper class of society, the upper crust, really enjoyed performance, really enjoyed uh, theater. And so um, that raised sort of the level that plays were written to because if you wrote something that was very clever, played with language, uh, that would sell because people were smart enough to understand it. Um, by the time you get to the Romans, the upper echelons of society stopped caring as much about it. And because that meant, because of that, um, the average consumer of plays of entertainment uh, ended up being not quite as educated, which meant that everything sort of became degenerated a little bit. Um, comedies essentially became slapstick, which is just full of like, oh, I punched you in the face. Think of, uh, I think we watched some bits of um, The Three Stooges when we talked about low comedy. Pretty much everything was there. Um, it saw the first group of people hired specifically to applaud at a performance. So I don't know if you know this, but it's a well-known psychological fact that uh, if you hear somebody laughing, hear somebody clapping, you are more likely to do those things yourself. And so um, basically the Romans would just pay people to do it. They would pay them to come and clap at their shows to make it easier for other people to decide that something was worthy of applause or worthy of clapping. Um, huge advancements in technical theater, uh, including the construction of amphitheaters that could be filled with water to reenact naval battles. Um, lots of different construction, especially uh, advancements from the Romans. Uh, and eventually people became pretty disinterested, should be uninterested there, in any performance besides bloody gladiatorial battles that were reenactments of famous battles. Ultimately, by the time Rome fell in 475 AD, they were so bloody and filled with sex and body things that they were banned by the Christian church when Rome fell in 475 AD. Okay, I don't want this video to become too terribly long, so I'm going to stop it here, and I will continue with the rest of these notes in the next one. See ya.